What we're about to do uh, today and next week, and you're like, man, we've been doing one chapter a week. Why not continue with that? Well, because uh, the literature that's unfolding in the rest of Daniel is called apocalyptic literature. Now, when you hear apocalyptic, what do you think of? Oh, explosion, what? Everything gone, everything done. <laughs> Any other things you think of? Well, you've heard of the zombie ap apocalypse, right? <laughs> but when we hear about apocalypse, these are the kind of ideas and things that come to our mind. Um, apocalyptic literature and scripture actually requires um, a bit more humility when you approach it in, in trying to interpret it because it has a wild visions and descriptions of things and people and kingdoms rising and falling. And yet we do not always know, unless there's a direct interpretation given right in Scripture, exactly what is being spoken of in that. Okay, So uh, apocalyptic literature is highly symbolic. Um, and, and here's the danger, especially in the Christian community over time, is that um, people try sometimes to identify every little thing, you know, and I went through this a lot in, in my, what, 56 years as different people um, predicted things through world events and attaching them to countries and actually to leaders, right? I mean, I remember vividly this one thought, like, is it, is it Gorbachev who had that mark on his forehead? So, you know, trying to equate all this stuff with, and, and we we got to be more careful than that, all right? Um, a more humble approach. However, there is something in these texts that is profound that you cannot miss. And that is the talk about the kingdom of God. We're going to hear today about the Ancient of Days, one who um, will become the sort of ruler over all at the end of time. The hard thing about apocalyptic literature, which you can find in Daniel, right, chapter 7 through 12, but also in Revelation you find a lot of it, is that you also don't know exactly what time and when these things would even be fulfilled in the visions. I would say, and I'm just going to throw that out there just for, to be provocative about it, is that about 90% of the apocalyptic literature that we read about, okay, has already been fulfilled or it's just ongoing in this time between Jesus' first and second coming. A lot of it's been fulfilled. So, you know, we don't need to actually be super concerned, and the text today is going to give us an awesome clue because we're going to look at Daniel, who actually has these visions, and who you can imagine would be like, what does this mean? And when he gets any interpretations, he's like, oh no, should I panic? Should I be anxious? You want to know what Daniel does? And this is true for you and I today. If we see any signs of the end times, whatever we think that may be, the call of Christians is to be busy and engaged about doing the work of God here on earth. That's what our motivation should be coming out of sort of uh, interpretations and things about apocalyptic literature, okay? So, with that intro about apocalyptic, okay, here's a summary of Daniel chapter 7 and a summary of Daniel chapter 8. Uh, let's look at this with a couple comments before Roger takes over today. I get to go draw. It's going to be great. Daniel has two dreams and visions, and they are out of this world, okay? First one, chapter 7, summary. There are four beasts described in his vision that looked like, there's another clue about apocalyptic literature, looked like, and they appear in succession. The first one is a lion with wings. The second one is a bear raised up on one of its sides. The third is a leopard with wings and four heads, a beast with ten horns. Terrifying, frightening, very powerful are these creatures. And out of this one with the ten horns, a little horn grows out of it, and then 
the Ancient of Days, which we sang about, appears, sitting on his throne. And as the beast is devouring and trampling underfoot all that it encounters, this beast is slain, its body destroyed, and thrown into a blazing fire. And one like the Son of Man, there's that language again, we've seen that a couple times in Daniel, comes in the clouds of heaven, approaches the Ancient of Days, and standing in his presence is given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion and kingdom will not pass away. It will never be destroyed. So, the interpretation that's given. Four beasts are four earthly kings. With the fourth one, most terrifying, where persecution of God's holy people happens, yet, in the end, the ancient of days, this son of man and their kingdom will be everlasting and all in all. I gave you a summary, okay, of chapter 7. Now how about chapter 8? Daniel sees a ram with two long horns. It charges west and north and south and couldn't be stopped. It became very great. Then a goat with a horn came from the west and shattered the ram's power. Yet the greatness of the goat gave way in time to four other horns. See how bizarre this is. And then another horn came out of these and set itself up as supreme. Sacrifices of God's people were given to it. A surrendering of the sanctuary was had and rebellion abounds. An interesting phrase ends this kingdom's description. Truth was thrown to the ground. There's an interpretation by the angel Gabriel who appears to Daniel and says, Son of man, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. The ram's two horns are the Medes and Persians. The goat is the king of Greece. His kingdom will be divided among four others, and then a powerful ruler will rise to power, a master of intrigue, become very strong, and bring devastation on the earth. He will cause deceit to prosper, consider himself superior, yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. That is a summary of chapter 7 and 8. And you're like, wow. If you haven't read that in preparation for today, you should read that and see how that unfolds with much more language. I gave you a summary. So for centuries, people have been trying to figure this out. Movements of world geopolitical happenings. Countries and leaders. And it's a bit presumptuous to do that and also very dangerous. I think um, what's interesting about some of this is even in our country where you have different like um, movements within even Christianity, right? In different veins of denominations or thoughts about the end times and people trying to map all this out. That what can happen is uh, you can start to think... Uh, that you know what's going to happen, and so maybe a country would even be manipulative in some of its policies even, right? Trying to make this come about or have this happen. And once that starts to happen, things can uh, sometimes go very bad. We do not know exactly how things will pan out, so to speak. But we do know from these texts exactly who holds the future and where it's heading. Next week, when we do uh, Daniel 9 through 12, I'll give you some summaries again. And what I'm going to talk about next week is the meaning of history. Because history is not cyclical like the Greeks thought or many Eastern religions think, right? That's sort of the cyclical, that's not the biblical worldview, not the revelation. It's also not existential, meaning. Uh, there's no meaning to any of it. (laughs) It's not that either. 
history in Scripture is linear. You might get some similar patterns that happen, right, within humanity and the rise and fall of kingdoms and things like that. It may seem cyclical, but it's linear. It's heading somewhere. And this is what the next couple of weeks, we'll just focus on some general themes. We're not going to label stuff and try to figure it all out, but we are going to talk about some things that come through loud and clear. The kingdom of God, what does that mean? What does that look like? And the meaning of history. So, a couple of things that we can get out of this, and then I'm going to head out of here soon. The kingdoms and kings of this world will from time to time set themselves over and against God and his kingdom come. As a result of these things, and they're mentioned in the stories, deceit and pride and throwing truth to the ground, worshiping idols of power, prestige, position of self or human greatness, they're going to be there. We can expect it. And we also know that there's going to be a lot of waywardness because we are sinful people. And our world is filled with so much brokenness and even poor leadership and ruling, right, around the world. And some of it comes with just a simple rejection of God's truth. And one thing these stories say clearly is that there will be a judgment one day and it will be God's to bring. Second thing, we know that God and his kingdom will prevail. I mentioned that. The third thing, should we fret or be anxious about any of this of what we might see happening and unfolding around us? I want to take my cue from Daniel, because we've been doing that. We've been looking at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here it is. Here's a cue. At the end of, near the end of chapter 8, right, after he sees the vision, he says this. Now listen to this. This is Daniel. He's, he's standing before <laughs> King Darius, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Belshazzar, right? I mean, these are powerful people. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and I went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision because it was beyond understanding. Now, why quote that from Daniel? Well, I think it's a cue. When you get anxious or you get fearful or you get worried about anything that you see going on in your own life, right, or around you or in world events, because we're such a global culture today, you know what's happening in other places. You can find, find that out. You can fill your mind with it. But I like Daniel where he says, I got up and I went about the king's business. Why could he do that? I think Daniel knows the end of the story. Whether it's in his lifetime or in the future, he knows the end. He has trust in God to be non-anxious, non-fearful, non-worrisome because he knows who holds the future. Thus he can be busy about the work of the kingdom of God. And I want to say that that is something we can take with us after today and next week and we have some other themes unfolding. I'm going to do, uh, in the coming weeks, gospel, Christian, covenant, reformed. What does that mean? Mission, advent, promise. Do you see where we're heading the rest of the year? Incarnation. And then we'll finish with discipleship. We'll look at the who, what, where, when, why of these things as they unfold through advent. So there you go. So with that, uh, I am going to turn it over to Roger and uh, our youth. And if there's any uh, kids yet in here, if you want to come with me uh, to that class, uh, discipleship group, you can come. The Lord bless you. Roger.
Sorry, it's going to take a little getting used to this. So Daniel's dream speaks of a kingdom that's coming that will endure forever, will not fail, that is and will be forever and ever. So from the beginning of Scripture, God's eternal sovereignty over all things is proclaimed. Remember the creation story in Genesis. First day, God created. It was good. Second day, created. It was good. Third day, it created. It was good. So all th- six days, six day, the sixth day, he creates the animals. And he said it was good. Then he created man. He didn't say it was good at that time, but after all was done, he looked and said, it's very good. So even though he didn't say that about us specifically, when he looked at all of creation that he had, all the work he had done, it is very good. Now, when I was growing up, you know, I was taught Well, seven days, that's a 24-hour period. God created it in seven days. Maybe. But remember, a thousand days is, what is it? I forgot the quote, sorry. What is it? Somebody can tell me? One day is like, or a thousand years is like one day to the Lord? Right. So we don't know. And quite honestly, we should humbly accept that. We don't know. Remember, the first chapter of Genesis was written as poetry. It's not a scientific treatise. It's not a historical account. It was written as poetry. God created. So we have to humbly accept that we don't know if he took a billion years to do something or whatever. Remember, God created time as well as created the universe. So what does that mean? That means that God is not subject to time. God is not limited by time. Time is one of his creations. And so he gave us the story of creation. It was the original manual written for dummies. And how do you describe creating billions of and billions of stars that's in one galaxy, and then you have billions and billions of galaxies. How do you describe that to a pre-scientific human being? God created, and it was good. That's all you need to know. (laughs) So, that, you know, story is written in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. What happens in Genesis 3? Yeah, crash and burn. <laughs> Think for a minute. If, if you spent years and years and years saving up money and you had this beautiful car that you wanted to have built for you, and so you have this custom car that's built for you. It is sleek. It's energy efficient but it can go zero to 60 in two seconds. Wow. God did that. And then handed the keys to a teenage son. What do you expect? Yeah, crash. The problem is it didn't only wreck the car, it wrecked the house, and the house collapsed and destroyed the neighbor's house, which caught on fire. Burned up not only the neighborhood, but the entire city. What, what would you do, you know, if your teenage son did that with this beautiful, beautiful vehicle of your dreams? What would you do? What would be your reaction? I'd be angry. I'd be sad. Now, it's dangerous to take our feelings and put those onto God, but I don't think it's beyond belief to think that he was angry and sad. So what did he do? He's the potter, we're the clay. 
Did he take this clay figurine and just smash it because he was mad? No, he offered a way out. Even then, he gave a promise. I will give you a son who will crush the head of the serpent. He'll bruise his heel, but he will crush the serpent. And that's Jesus. You know, Jesus is the center of all that redemption, that whole process. So what did Jesus' death accomplish? Anybody? What did it accomplish? Thoughts? He paid Say it out loud. I'm sorry? He paid for our sins. Paid for our sins. Exactly right. So then, not only did he pay for our sins, he did that through dying because we had, we had the sentence of death on us. So not only did we rebel against God, when Adam and Eve went for a joyride and smashed the car, destroyed the neighborhood and the city, God said, well, you don't get to live in Eden anymore. That's one of the consequences. Another consequence is, you destroyed the whole city. You're going to have to sweat. You're going to have to figure out how to make an, a living, how you're going to grow your food, because you can no longer be in Eden where you can just stroll through the morning and pluck an apple, take a peach, grab a plum, whatever you wanted to eat. Life was easy. It was paradise. That's not the case anymore. So you're going to have to work. You're going to have to clean up the mess. You're going to have to sweat to get your food every day. So when Jesus died, he took our sentence of death and by re being resurrected from the dead, he conquered death he conquered evil. And as Daniel saw in the vision, he established the kingdom. But remember what Jesus said about the kingdom. How is the kingdom described? One of the descriptions was it's like a mustard seed. Very, very tiny. It's planted in between all of the rack and ruin of this universe. It's been planted, but it doesn't flourish overnight. It takes time to grow. And so he planted that seed. And as Daniel saw in the vision, when, he, when Jesus was ushered into the Ancient of Days, he was given dominion over all of creation. Now, remember that Daniel is written from the perspective of Palestine, Babylon, Persia, that whole area. His vision doesn't talk about Russia or Europe, the United States, any of the Americas. His vision is what is coming in this small area of the world when Jesus comes as a baby and is incarnate. So that's his focus, because the focus is what is happening in terms of creating, establishing that kingdom of God. So God didn't abandon us to ruin at, at the end of, of uh, the story of creation when there's the fall and Adam and Eve are banished from Eden. He provided a promise, and then he continued to give covenants, Abraham, covenant with Joshua when Joshua led the, the Israelites into the promised land, into Canaan. Year after year after year, there were the covenants in place, and yet we humans messed it up every time. Provide animal sacrifice. People did that, but it didn't change what was here. And so that's why Jesus had to come and, number one, be faithful in every way when 
Everybody else had failed. The kings of, of the land failed. Some were uh, set up as very powerful, and yet Solomon, one of the most powerful, wise kings on earth ever, what happened with him at the end of his life? He bowed down to idols along with some of his wives. If there's no hope for a guy like that, what hope is there for us? Again, that's why Jesus had to come, the perfect human being, because he was the incarnate God. So by being both God and man, he was able to take all of the punishment for every one of us, billions of people, and satisfy that, that uh, sentence of death. So, when the Son of Man took on human flesh, what was impossible for any of us was possible because of being both God and man. So Jesus basically, at that time, overturned and ended the rule of Satan over the world. But because that mustard seed takes time to grow, we don't see the fullness of that kingdom now yet. We know it's been planted. We know it's growing. We are part of that growth. But we're in the end times. So the war is won, but there's still these battles that are going on. Don't know why Satan doesn't realize that. Don't know why Satan continues to torment us. Don't know why he wants to keep people from being Christians. Probably his ego. I mean, that's probably what caused his downfall in the first place. So he wants to sweep as many with him as he goes into hell. I don't know. I don't think anyone out of us knows why he continues to do that and fight against the kingdom that's already been established. Jesus' sacrifice took on all of our sin, took on all of our punishment, and yet Satan continues to try to undermine us. So the kingdom is here. It's growing, but it's not fulfilled. So between Christ's first coming, which planted the kingdom, and Christ's second coming, it's here but not fulfilled. It's here but not complete. Now Jesus' words and his actions exemplify what the kingdom, how, how we should act as part of that kingdom. For example, the Sermon on the Mount lays out his expectations for us. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble. Now there's two phrases that are used. Uh, you'll see a different phrase used in Matthew where it's called kingdom of heaven. Anyone have an idea why he calls it kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God? Simply two different translations. One is Hebrew, one is Greek. So if somebody talks about the kingdom of heaven, it's the same thing, kingdom of God. So now that we have this kingdom established, we serve a king. How do we see it? How do we hear it? How is it manifested to us? Thoughts? Shout it out. Salvation from Jesus. Okay. And so we live lives of gratitude because of that. And how is that evidenced? Other thoughts? Holy Spirit, our love towards others, very good, 
Fruits of the Spirit, joy, peace. Yep. Galatians 5. Yeah. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. But what it, so that, that's what we should be doing. That's how we should live. What do you think it means for the rest of creation? Do we go to church and then the rest of the week we steal and kill and maim and it doesn't matter? No, obviously. Walk with him, beside him. And what does that mean for the work that we do? Has to be every day, okay. Other thoughts? How we model Jesus, yes. Help other people find him, yeah. That's part of us being disciples. What else? Renovation plan. I like it. Yeah. Remember the whole the whole city got destroyed. So we we need a renovation plan. So how how do we do that? Absolutely. So it doesn't matter what our profession, what our work, what we do. Everything should be with the idea of we're renovating the place to the glory of God. So that means, you know, whether it's a dirty area of politics or I'm just a laborer, I'm just, I just do this. No, no, no. Yes, you maybe create something with your hands, but do it to the glory of God. And remember, that's why you're doing it. So every, every part of creation, Abraham Kuyper was a theologian, but he was also the prime minister of the Netherlands back in the 1800s. He said, every square inch of the universe belongs to God, and our job is to help reclaim it. Every square inch. Now, that's a lot of work. I don't know what that means for other worlds, other galaxies. Does God have people there, too? We don't know. But every square inch of the universe belongs to him. It takes Every one of us. You're absolutely right. Yep. So the kingdom of God was inaugurated. It was plant the seed was planted. It's growing. It's spreading. We thankfully, not because of any merit of ourselves, purely God's grace. We're chosen to be part of that. That's the beauty of the kingdom of God. But what happens to those who reject it? It's a second rebellion. There's no third chance. You have one chance now in your life to accept that grace that has been given. So our choice is to embrace God's salvation fully. And that's the tough part. We've been redeemed, we've been washed clean by Jesus' blood, and yet, and yet, we have that dirty, dark part that, you know, we sin. We constantly miss the mark of what God expects of us. So again, Jesus washed us clean. We need to grasp that and hold on to that and fill our lives with it. And as you said, 
fill the entire universe with it. So is God's kingdom present or future? Yes, it's both. It's small. In some ways it's small now. And yet there's that unfolding that will occur until finally Jesus comes again and all of it is fulfilled. All of these prophecies are fulfilled. So God's kingdom was planted. That's past tense. We're part of the kingdom now, present tense. And yet there's a future as well. There's that promise. Total fulfillment. Total reclaim, reclaiming reclamation of the entire universe of our lives in total. I have this mental vision that when we stand before the throne of God, there's going to be a lot of us, whatever you want to define that as, a lot of us that's just going to be burned away. <laughs> and it's only the blood of Christ that fills in those gaps and creates us, recreates us as, as a perfect human being that is able to stand in the presence of God because otherwise we would not be able to stand there. So the future, future connotation is uh, Jesus said it in the Sermon of the Mount. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out, cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Then I will declare, he said, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. All future tense. And yet, there are those that are going to say, when did I give you a cup of water? When did I visit you in prison? You did it for this person, and you did it for me. You know, the, the prophecies, the, the, they call them the little prophets, only because they're short in... in uh, Length, They're like Amos and, and uh, Hosea. Th those prophets talked about do justice. Walk humbly with your God. That's our call. Do justice. Walk humbly with our God. Work every day to reclaim every square inch of God's universe. So currently, it's provisional. It's incomplete. It's been revealed if people are open to having it revealed, but it also remains hidden to many. And as was said, it's our job to make sure that they do know about it and that they have the opportunity. We don't know if they're selected or not. That's not, our, that's not up to us, but it's our job to make him known. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth a according to his purpose, which he set forth a plan for ful fulfillment of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For God was pleased to have all fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And yet, again, Romans 8, 19 and 20, 19 through 21, actually. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subject to fulfillment Futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. So this is the already but not yet tension that we live in. 
And that tension will continue to exist until Jesus finally comes that second time. Now, we individually are involved in that tension, but our church is also involved in that tension. We're the church, after all. And so we have to think in terms of, do we split off from the denomination because we're upset about human sexuality or we're upset about women as deacons or that's an old argument are we upset about women as elders oh, again another old argument you know we obviously fail even as a church because the christian reformed church split off from the reformed church which split off from the roman catholic church it, you know, we can't get along. So obviously Satan is in there digging, you know. Stoking that anger and jealousy. Turns into rage. We're right. We're going to walk out because we're right. Obviously it affects us as a church. After all, the church is for sinners. Jesus hung out with the sinners. We're all sinners. So we have to accept that. Our relationship with fellow Christians is broken. So our church is a broken institution. It's going to have brokenness in how it relates to other churches, other groups. That's the tension that we live in. We all recognize, yeah, they're Christians, but... Sorry, for all of us, it's but. Because we're broken, we're, f we're failures. We can't achieve that even though Christ has claimed us. It's also a tension for our individual lives. We are new creatures in Christ with the spirits dwelling in us. And yet, and yet, we're not at perfection. But it's a foretaste. It's a foretaste of what will be. So our self-image should reflect this tension as well. We're a new person, but yet we're imperfect. And that means walk humbly. Walk humbly with our God. Be faithful to his calling. Strive every day, every minute, every second to become more like Christ. That's tough. I get in a meeting and pretty soon you're thinking, this person really doesn't know what they're talking about. How do I respond? Yet, I should be thinking, what would Christ do in that situation? I have one woman who constantly complains about everything that the city does. This is in the temporary job that I have. Nothing is right. City council doesn't know what they're doing. I'm not doing my job. You know, blah, 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 blah. And finally you think, do you have nothing positive in your life? But yet one day it struck me. I should be sympathetic to her. And I should love her. It's like, how do I do that? How do I do that? But that's what we're called to do. Some of the stories about Jesus healing, it says he had compassion. He had compassion and therefore he healed. Not everyone got healed. You want to say, why not? Why can't we do that today? Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Go pick up your mat and walk. So that already and not yet doesn't help us with 
dealing with the pain that we have, that we see, and yet it does because we know the promise of what is coming. So, you know, good people suffer. Bad things happen to good people. Joe is an example. My father-in-law was, was a very gregarious, outgoing person. Any stranger that he met on the street, he would strike up a conversation, and within five minutes, they'd be friends. But what did Satan do? What did sin cause? It stole his mind. He declined into dementia. Why? How, how can that happen to a good Christian man? How can that happen? How can that happen to Joe? Not only is he suffering, but Muffy is suffering. How can that happen? Again, that's that pernicious impact of sin. And we won't be free from that until Christ comes again. Those are all the questions that Job had to ask and wrestle with. You know, why is this being done? I was upright. Didn't mean he was perfect, but he was an upright man. Again, Satan chose him to make an example of him. It backfired. Love it when it backfires on him. But again, the suffering that we go to points to the future, points to when Christ comes, points to when all things will be made new. He will wipe every tear from your eye. When you're in the middle of it, that's tough to hold on to. That's tough to believe. But that's our responsibility. I saw a little clip of Billy Graham last night. And he said, there were times, it's a signal that I need to wrap it up. <laughs> there were times when I felt the presence of God. Jesus was with me. And there were other times where I couldn't even touch him or see him or feel him in my life. His mother said, that's what faith is about. That's when you go by faith because you don't see him or touch him. Hold on to his promise that at the end he will overcome all. He's already won the war. It's just a matter of the wipe up, clean up battles that are still going on. So that grace of God does not destroy what was wrecked. It reclaims it, rebuilds it, makes it pure again. So what, what, what implication does that have for our lives in terms of how we interact? You know, we're here in the United States of America, one of the most powerful nations on earth, one of the most rich, richest nations on earth. Probably not the richest, but, you know, certainly one of them. And yet, what comes out of Hollywood? Some good stuff, a lot of bad stuff. What do we do? How do we engage with this culture? Do we just unquestionably, hey, it's capitalism, make as much money as you can, you know? He who has the most toys at the end wins? No, that's not the criteria. And yet, how do we interact with this society? What role do we play in it? Now, John Calvin, can't have a sermon without John Calvin, right? All truth is from God, and consequently, if wicked men have something or have said anything that is true and just, we ought not to reject it, for it has come from God, because all good things come from God. There's a lot of bad stuff that may come, but even non-Christians can do good things. So we shouldn't reject everything, nor should we just gullibly swallow it all down and take it into our lives. 
we have to be discerning. We have to evaluate all of that, all of culture in the light of what God requires of us as Christians and what he requires of us as a society. So we have a heavy responsibility. But again, it calls for that discernment and remembering the promise that's coming that we hold on to. So for us, it's, it's building a genuinely Christian culture. And a culture means all aspects of our lives. How we live, what kind of a car we drive, the work that we do, how we do our work, how we engage with our governments, little, bigger, federal government. All of that, all of that belongs to God, so let's reclaim it. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. That's the end of my notes. So hopefully, that's the end of our presentation. I hesitate to call it a sermon. So, would you pray with me? Father, at the beginning of the service, we sang, our God is an awesome God. You didn't destroy what we destroyed, what we messed up. Instead, you gave the promise, this all will be cleaned up. This all will be purified. Reclaim it all in your name. So, Father, give us the strength to do that. Give us the strength to live every day, day by day, hour by hour, second by second. Live in the strength of your spirit to work and strive to be more like Christ every, every, in every interaction that we have, in everything that we do. We ask for that strength that we can have the words to speak to those around us, to have the strength to do what we should do, to walk as Jesus walked. God, we acknowledge that we're still sinners, we acknowledge that we're weak. And that's why we need the strength of your spirit. So, Father, bless us with your spirit. Watch over us, guide us as we walk out of here and re-engage in our lives through this coming week. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're done. You're welcome.